now saw sitting in this place. And I'm sure that Engelston feels the pain too, because she's the only member of the other side who sits at this place. Mr. Speaker, while thanking people, I would like to take this opportunity to publicly thank on my behalf, and I'm sure on behalf of all of us, the numerous people who gave, volunteered, lent their assistance, donated in whatever form they did to the relief efforts for Hurricane Dorian and the ongoing uh, efforts to the pandemic of COVID, whether it was money, support, time and effort, um, in education, computers, whatever it was, I'd like to thank each and every one of them, certainly on my behalf, and I'm sure on behalf of all of us. And their work, and their work still continues today. Mr. Speaker, I would also like to join my, uh, well, I'd like to express my uh, thanks. Um, the member who will succeed me is currently president of my Rotary Club. And as many of you know, through Barry Ratz and other Rotarians, they have organized, along with the government and the Consultative Committee on COVID, a tremendous effort to make sure persons have been vaccinated and continue to get vaccinated. We owe them a great deal of gratitude for the work they have done. Some, uh, and I stand to be corrected, some 68,000, 62,183 people in the Bahamas have been vaccinated so far, some 48,000 for the first time, and the remaining 12,000 have been vaccinated twice. I am one of those persons who have been vaccinated twice, have my two weeks, so I am fully vaccinated. And I urge each... <laughs> and I urge each and every member of... Uh, each and every citizen, resident, person living within the Commonwealth of the Bahamas to go and get their second vaccination because the only way we are going to grow out of the present situation with the pandemic is to become fully vaccinated so we can return to normal tourism and the growth in the tourism industry and thereby create employment for those who have been furloughed or unemployed during this time. Mr. Speaker, I rise today with a great degree of pride because this is probably, this is my 25th or so budget communication and my last, voluntarily. In my time in parliament, in both chambers, I have had the privilege of being an opposition senator from 1990, 1987 to 1992, a government senator from 1992 to 1987, 1997, an opposition MP from 2002 to 2007, and a government MP from 2007 to 12, and then again from this period from 2017 to 21. During my term, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm boasting, but it is a not great honor for me, I have served all three, all four Bahamian prime ministers, Lyndon Finling. I've served under all four, so Lyndon Finling, Right Honourable Perry Christie, the Right Honourable Hubert Ingram, and the, currently the Member of Parliament for Kalani. And I, treat, I take that as a great honour and a privilege. As well as I do, I have been appointed by three leaders of the FNM. I was appointed to Senate by Cecil Wallace Whitfield, to Cabinet by Hubert Ingram, and by Cabinet again by the current leader and future leader of the FNM, the Member for Kalani. It's been Speaker, I've also had the privilege and, and honor of presenting budgets in this place and the other place as Minister of Tourism, Attorney General, I think two or three times, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and the Minister of, of Financial Services, Trade, Industry, and Immigration. So one has to forgive the member for Exuma for his lack of understanding of the budget the other day because he, nor most of the other members, apart from Cat Island and, since, and Eggleston, haven't been part of this process. I listened last Wednesday when, when the member for Cat Island talked about an Alice in Wonderland budget. I think those were his words as he described. Exuma, sorry, Exuma. Alice in Wonderland. Well, first of all, I did a little bit of research. Alice in Wonderland is a book by Lewis Carroll. <laughs> And I'll quote, I'll quote just very, these are not my own words. And it's full of fanciful characters. One of them, one of them is the caterpillar who helps Alice through her growth in life. The other is a Cheshire cat who teaches Alice 
how to follow the rules, but also teaches her the rules change throughout life. But the whole goal of Lewis Carroll's book, Alice in Wonderland, is a lighthearted way of teaching children how to grow up and live in a dangerous world. So you can obviously know what I'm going to say next. I suggest the member for Exuma grows up and leaves his fantasy world behind and comes to terms with the dangerous world in which we live in. recognized the honorable member for the Exomas on Ragged Island. Are, are you on a point of order? Speak of the member for the Don, who is an experienced legislator, has the rights to his interpretations of anything. He does not, he does not have the right to say to a, another duly elected member that they should grow up, Mr. Speaker. And I would ask him to refrain and uh, withdraw those remarks and uh, carry on smartly, Mr. S Mr. Speaker. I'm sorry I hit a raw nerve, but when, the, when you hear what we've had heard from, the, from that member, the, the pressure's on, election is coming, and what comes, comes. Mm -hmm. The member also went on to say he could, could not trust these figures. That was a, a big theme in his speech. Oh. Well, firstly, Firstly, Mr. Speaker, hopefully he doesn't get upset. I'd like to apologize for him if he doesn't understand these figures. He, he doesn't mean to insult the members, the many people who prepared these budgets. Yeah. Because they spent long hours making sure these figures came here. Any of you who's been involved in the budget, it's long hours, many hours, late at night. Hard-working civil servants, the same ones that prepare the budget every year. Same ones. Having said that, I'd like also to take this opportunity to publicly thank all of those officers, public officers who worked with me during my various ministries, who educated me on the budget process, who taught me about the budget process, who put up with me trying to squeeze that extra bit of, of extra whatever out of the budget. They are the finance officers, the people at the Ministry of Finance are good, hard-working people. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to take a little bit of time just to look at some of the aspects of the budget. If we look at this document, some 23.7% of the budget is wages and salaries. And just take a couple of the other higher items. 17% is interest. 13% is subsidies. 9.4% is for social benefits. 9.5% for other payments. 8.3% for other services, which totals 81.8%. So 81.8% of this document hardly changes. It's very accurate. It's detailed. It's calculated. It's the, the finance officer knows 180 employees, so much in a line. They know what it is. So these figures can be trusted. Now, the political slant to them, that may be what the member was talking about. But the real figures in here can be trusted. You just have to look at Wednesday last week when the member for South Beach stood up and gave an excellent speech about education. Yeah. 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 And, if you, and if you look at Head 35 of the budget, which is the Department of Education, you will see from 2019-2020 budget, 167.3 million went to, uh, I think, to salaries. In, 19, in the next year, 168.1, not much of a variance. And this year, 168.67 million, not much. Not much movement in there, but he went on out of a total budget of 200 million. So 168 point something went to salaries, 200 million total. And then he went on to say 160 employees were hired to fill the special needs as a result of COVID and, and other relief and HR and, and very, did it very well. So I won't repeat, you just, you, everyone heard him. But that 160 employees is covered by the global provisions of some of some $1.87 million in this very budget. So nothing cloak and dagger, it's all in here. So it's covered. So that obviously the hardworking people have calculated how much those 160 people 
are going to cost, what categories they were going into, and produced a figure in this budget which can be trusted. Mr. Speaker, I'll just review some other parts of the, of the budget, and allow me the liberty of this. Ministry of National Security, for Mount Moriah, they, his budget increased from 7.4 million to 12.1 odd million dollars. And he'll speak to it better than I can. 2.1 million of that was for security service contracts, only up $500,000. 1.9 million of that was for security for CCTV, which was up by some $300,000. And 2.4 million of that was, some, was citizen security, up by a million. These are not fanciful increases. They are, but what happened? Crime is down. Under this administration, crime is down. I'm the, ministry of Works, 41 million to 47 million, some $6 million, all of which is going into capital projects for the water and sewage company, water and sewage corporation. But the member, unfortunately, is not here. He's probably trying to find out where he laid the pipe that he didn't lay. <laughs> the whole year, five years he was here, no pipe. But the FNM is delivering not only water in, in Cat Island, water in other areas, roads, Long Island. They are delivering to all Bahamians all over the uh, country, irrespective of who's, who's the party in their MP. Mr. Speaker, what this caring FNM caring. does, it delivers. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, for uh, Southern Shores, for instance, in social services, his budget went up from some 60 million to 80 odd million dollars. 20, an increase from 25 million dollars. 20 million dollars of that alone went for social assistance benefits. Caring government, you know, caring government, and you know that's as a result of of um, the whole issue of the pan of the pandemic, Mr. Speaker. So that's why I say it's totally irresponsible for the member, in my opinion, just so he's, he, for the member for Exuma to talk about Alice in Wonderland in the last two budget cycles. We have been crafted against the most. Uh, fancy economic downturn that we've never seen in the history of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. As I said, Alice in Wonderland, good theme he chose, was about changing times and the rules changing. Dorian and COVID turned this country and the rules upside down, and we are facing a totally dangerous world now where we need to leave. Having said that, Mr. Speaker, it takes an FNM government to govern this country at a time of crisis, the crisis that we've never f seen in this country, ever. <laughs> Timing is perfect. Timing is perfect in life. If we had had the woulda, coulda, shoulda, Christy Davis administration, we would have been in a terrible, difficult situation now. No doubt. No doubt. Sorry, Katan, I walked in right at the right time. <laughs> That's why, Mr. Speaker, you have a caring government which is compassionate, and this government is in good hands. You know, while you're in opposition, it's easy to be loose with the details whatever you want to say, because all you're concerned about then is winning the government, you know. This government, I've mentioned, provided many social benefits and unemployment policies, you know. We all accept that state-owned enterprises need some attention. They cannot continue to be a drain on the economy. But now is not the time to sell them off, as some would recklessly say, because that results in unemployment. Mm -hmm. So what does your caring government does? It takes the subvention to Bahamas Air up from 19 million to 30 million dollars so as to maintain those employees so when we come out of COVID, Bahamas Air is ready to carry on their service. 
That's wisdom, that's caring. Wisdom. Otherwise, those persons, if you terminate them, would have still ended up on the government, so, on the social services side, and the money, the equation is the same. So when the COVID start, uh, restrictions start to ease up, Bahamas Air will be in a position to fly to the various islands to bring back needed relief and tourism and, and social benefit, and we'll be further, further ahead, of God, ahead of the game. Same reason, Mr. Speaker, why the government, remember through all of this, the government did not lay off any employees or stop their pay. They kept them on. If we can't state enough the dramatic effect of, of, Corian, of COVID and, and Dorian, and that's what, COVID, sorry. That, that, <laughs> Corian's hard stuff. Corian's hard stuff. And that's why you'll find in the budget speech, there's seven pillars contained in the Accelerate Bahamas plan, which they help hope will be, will grow this economy out of the current space uh, that we're in and provide for a better environment come the end of the day. You know, it's a free country. People criticize the FNM for what they do, the way they do it, how they do it. But one thing is crystal clear in my opinion. The FNM, it, the Bahamas is in better hands under the, an FNM government than it would ever be under Cat Island. You know, the member for Exuma went on about the public debt. And it always annoys me when people talk, do that. If you look in the budget estimates, you will see that debt servicing went from 345 odd million in fiscal year 2019 2020 to some 396 million in 2021 to some 512 million. It's right here for everyone to see. They're not hiding debt servicing. It's right here. Matter of fact, the Minister of State, when he made his press statement on the day of the budget, says, today, the and I quote, today the government still has revenue problems. He admits it, says it right up front, and says, because of this, continue to quote, we are forced to run high crisis times deficits, which are adding to unsustainable debt levels. Not hiding from it, right there, black and white for all to see. But the Minister of State and also the Prime Minister, but I'll quote the Minister of State here, the Prime Minister says similar words, and he, as when he says, I do not believe that we can tax our way out of the current sit circumstances. We must grow out of it. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, if, and I'm probably the wrong person to say this, but if you look at the figures for the national debt in this country, they have increased every single year since 1967. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Correct. Every single year. 1967 was a positive, ca no national debt. And every successive year, both sides have increased the national debt. Both sides. So let's not, let's take it, but it's there. Now, we have to do something about it. What happened? When we came into office, $400 million worth of debts that just sort of come out, out of the woodwork. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Some of them, mm -hmm. Treasury never even knew about, you know, never even knew about. And then I, I just quote my good friend, the member for Carmichael, when he said in an interjection on Wednesday, when we talk about hurricanes, he, he said, under the PLP, Yoakum, uh, Joaquin's damage was 120 million, and Matthew's damage was what was it, 580 for a total of some 700 million dollars of damage. That's what they had to contend with. So maybe that's why they left the bill. Dorian alone was 3.4 billion. A B. Difference of 2.7 billion dollars, and we only have the small, manageable, upfront, advertised national debt. <laughs> You know, the Prime Minister, the member for Clarny in his speech talked about the three, 327 bill, million, million, sorry, in, in the last budget under the Resilient Bahamas plan. These are real figures. They're not hidden anywhere. They're real figures that they had to, they had to deal with. And you know what? The speaker, the Prime Minister, the different ministers come who come and speak. We'll talk about their individual ministries and their policies and what, how they are going to live within this budget. But most budgets 
are made, as I said, before a normal set of circumstances. The last two cycles are by no means normal. They are totally abnormal. But having said that, the Minister for Clarny, the Member for Clarny said, they are trying to put in place a social and economic strategy to beat off the most extraordinary times of our lifetimes. That's what this budget is about. And you know, if you refer to pages four and five of the budget communication, and I'll just quote liberally, and it says, my government adopted a well thought out strategy to address unprecedented times we are facing. This included gathering more recent public health, social economic data, and our approach has been threefold. To protect the well-being and endanger the and, and gender the confidence of the citizens and residents. That's number one. Maintain economic stability. Plant the seeds for accelerated recovery. Protect the health and safety of Bahamians. Provide adequate social support to the vulnerable members of our community. Stabilize the economy, su sustain employment, and accelerate government reforms. That's what this government did. And the member op members opposite constantly say the government has no plan. That's an equal part of the plan there. And then you go on, the member for Clarny on pages six, seven, eight, I just paraphrase very quickly, talks about what happened, updated members of the House. 25.5 million in public health for COVID. 118 million for government-funded unemployment assistance. 32.8 million in social assistance. 44.4 million on payroll support, 53.3 million in business continuity support, the largest ever in the history of the Bahamas for Bahamian businessmen and small businesses was done under this government. So, Mr. Speaker, that is where we are against the background of, of this budget and where we are going to under the planned resiliency budget. Since the last budget exercise, the GDP of this country has contracted between 15 and 24 percent, whichever figures you take. That's a 20, a, a, almost a quarter of the GDP disappeared. So when you world economies downgraded, the Bahamas growth downgraded. We had 93 in, I think, July of last year, we, had, we lost 96.3% of our tourism and 91% of our stopover tourism. Can you imagine that hitting your business if you're running a business? 90% of your revenue just poof. Mr. Speaker, these are serious times. So the reduction in government revenues turned out to some, to a deficit of some $1.3 billion. That's the times we face. Recurrent expenditure, recurrent revenues uh, shrunk, and we're faced against that background when, they, when the, the, the government starts to present this budget. Obviously, members opposite will find something wrong with every part of the budget. But one thing the member for Clarney did, and I'm not looking for a job next time, so I'm just saying the way it is, is he produced his resilient, accelerated Bahamas recovery plan. I'm not looking for jobs. Some of you other fellows might be. <laughs> You're not here. No, you, you, you know, anyway. And, and you, can't offer, you can't offer me anything like you did, maybe the punch says you did for them other fellows. No, 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 no. So the accelerated Bahamas, uh, Bahamas recovery plan is there to strengthen the impact of much COVID needed support. Re-engage displaced officers. Stimulate the domestic economy. Accelerated greater value in the tourism industry and accelerate innovation in government. That's what the, this year's budget plan is about. You know, we only have to look in history. You look at the United States, the Great Depression under uh, President Roosevelt, what did they do? The governments invested and spent money in their economies to bring back confidence, to bring back trade, to bring out industry, to bring back employment. And there's examples of that all over the world. How did, how did the government react? How did your caring, thoughtful government react? 26.6 million 
to the water storage. Uh, you know, when you get a chance to be over here, you can make those comments. But it's very difficult when you're faced with the intricate part of when you say the budget is there, the revenue is there, the expenditure is there, is to craft a budget that has been as well crafted as this one to make sure they impact every single thing. Money went, $2.6 million went to the Water and Sewerage Corporation to make sure Bahamians were continued to be employed. Money went to Bahamas Air to make sure Bahamians were continued to be employed. 4.1 million went to the airport to make sure Bahamians were continued to be employed. 5 million went to schools, public schools, to make sure children were educated. And the minister, the member for South Beach talked brilliantly about this. If we don't get them at the, at the primary school level, we are going to lose another generation. And what does the government do? $2,000, correct me if I'm wrong, member, for each student to help schools build. A million dollars in grants to the primary schools so they can rebuild their schools. Land available so they can build new schools. So the younger generation, the primary school, who will be the children, who will be our next leaders, will get a good education. That is important. We've taken the graduation rate from I think it was from 40% to 67%. You know, one thing the FNM needs to do, and, and hopefully you guys, you, sorry, you members do it in your speeches, is tout the successes that the FNM government have successfully done, notwithstanding COVID and Dorian, over this last period in government, because they have been monumental. <laughs> Against the background, no potable water in Cat Island, woulda, shoulda, coulda and whatever, you know? And to make it, to carry on in this vein, if you read, if you go to page 23 of the budget communication, and I quote, as a result of these extraordinary financial circumstances, Mr. Speaker, the deficit widened from 626.9 to 879 over the corresponding period, right? And then the next line is important. This outturn is however consistent with the budgetary plan approved by Parliament. So the plan we approved last year, this year's outturn, is consistent with a budget that we sat in here last year, and all of us. The outturn is consistent with the term now. Yeah. Prior to Doran, I already mentioned, there were some $400 million of debt that they left behind that had to be absorbed into the, into the um, budget system. And many of those were PPEs. We forgot about those. We haven't mentioned those for a while. Some were dated, I think, May 7th, 2017. May 9th. Thank you. Certainly before the election. Drawn up in offices outside the office of the Attorney General and unbeknownst to the Ministry of Finance. That's the plan. So in order to avoid this, the current FNM government came to Parliament and passed, introduced and passed, what was it, the Fiscal Responsibility Act, the Debt Management Act, which comes into effect in two weeks, time, the end of the month, the Public Procurement Act. They put out quarterly budgets on the web, in the newspaper. The government's budget is public. That is fiscal responsibility. So these PPE signed on May 7th are now a thing of the past because the Public Procurement Act specifically outlaws those type of expenditures within a certain period before an election. That's fiscal responsibility, not buying government. That is why that is one of the pillars of the seventh, seventh pillar, sixth pillar, I think. Seventh, seventh pillar of the government auxiliary Bahamas. Don't worry, Senator, you won't distract me because you could mumble under your breath as much as you like. It ain't gonna happen. The budget for the fiscal year 2021 will remain in line with the targets, targeted, uh, targets established under the fiscal strategy report. Debated in here, passed in here. Now. The member for Kalani comes back quite rightly and says, we have invoked the exceptional circumstances clause. That's a responsible thing to do. The government, the opposition even agreed to it. 
So let's, I'm trying to put this in reality, not politics. The Fiscal Responsibility Act was debated, passed. The report came here. We debated, agreed to it, and we agreed to the special exemption clause to do it. And this year's budget is within, within the framework of that fiscal strategy report. So we have the, so what's the plan? Member for Kalani excluded, uh, uh, mentioned it. There are seven categories of our way to grow out of this problem, not tax ourselves. So we're not trying to put any more burden on the Bahamian people, many of whom are furloughed, have used up savings, maybe unemployed, whatever the reason, not to tax them anymore, but to grow ourselves out of them. One, job creation. Two, small business development, health care, tourism growth, public service sector, digitization, and fiscal responsibility. The speaker, you only have to go to this budget. <coughs> Some from pages 27 to 52 is lays out the plan. And you just need to highlight some of them, you know, whether it's unemployment benefit. There were tax concessions given that if you hire so many people, $400 of that tax per week will go towards the employment. That will help a lot of people. It's been proven. We've done it before. And I can't remember the figures, but maybe the prime minister in wrapping up will tell us. But numbers of people were hired under those same provisions and put back to work job in improvement, um, you know, then there, there's, I think you said the Prime Minister said there's about 1,000 small business and businesses applied for that provision under the, the, previous, the previous section. So there's a, an element of job creation. We create for, for MICAL a special economic recovery zone so that the de development of those islands can go ahead and, and happen and, and, and spur them on. For Abaco, for two members for Abaco and Grand Bahama, that the, the uh, special economic zone was extended to the end of the year so that Bahamians can take advantage of that because they may not have had the chance to having deal with the other problems from Dorian and COVID. So they can take advantage of that. These are ways that this plan decides to do it. This, the Prime Minister mentioned um, tourism growth. Right out here, we have a $230 million development in the port of Nassau, which will make us the envy of the Caribbean when cruise tourism comes. Mr. Speaker, you only have to walk out there and see the number of Bahamian people and firms employed in doing that work every day, good paying jobs. The construction industry is one of those industries you're, you're $1,000 a week and up. Many Bahamians, many Bahamians working out there, getting ready for the coming back, either of home porting or when our tourism development happens. The other, one of the other ones was health care. Well, it would be wrong of me when my, my good friend, member for... Um, Elizabeth is next to me because I know he'll spend a lot of time talking about the money that's already in the bank to build the extension of the Princess Margaret, which I'm sure he worked on when he was there in, in the Ministry of Health, and also the RAN, and also the other provisions in health care so that we can have a healthy nation. The member for Kalani talked about uh, telemedicine, which he started under the, under the former administration, and that will continue. Fiscal responsibility, I've already talked about. Digitization and transformation, this budget speech talks about that. And you only have to look online. Passports are online. Immigration's online. Social services are online. I'm probably missing a lot of them. I mean, you can get your driver's licenses online. This is transformative government. And in order to make sure persons feel and can get into that, there's a tax relief for computers, hardware, and digitization transformation. That's part of a caring government. So, Mr. Speaker, you can see where these, these growth areas um, to, 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 yes, to help Centerville, I forgot to just that, to help Centerville and others, uh, Baintown, the City of Nassau Revitalization Act has been extended for another five years to allow those areas within, you know, it's not just up this here, the City of Nassau continues all the way to Wolf Road, goes all the way out here to, to um, uh, yeah, and it covers, it covers Centerville, doesn't it? It covers Angleston and a number of those areas to help businesses in those areas grow. Um, so that's what this caring government has, has talked about. Mr. Speaker, obviously on the revenue side, there had to be some changes. But the member for Killarney made it very clear that the government intends to maintain a focus on improving revenue collection and restoring the fiscal health of the country 
by collecting outstanding existing taxes and also improving taxes. And I think the, the Ministry of Finance is being helped with by um, various tax uh, offshore companies to look at the way that we can amend our tax structure. But as it was stated in the paper, we're not going to be dictated to by other persons when it comes to a 15% mandatory corporate income tax. That's a sovereign country's responsibility to decide what they are going to do. The speaker, some 14,000 homes have been added to the real property tax roll. One of those homes was actually my father built. Because it got built, never sold, it never made it into the real property tax. He built it for a client. So there are many of those which will increase the budget revenues by some $14 million. You know, and none of us like to pay taxes. But there are cases where if you'd move your house from owner-occupied to a commercial entity, it's a response. If you want roads and hospitals and everything else, you have to pay your fair share of the taxes. So therefore, the government's saying, if you now take your house where you lived in and rent it out, it should apply to the commercial business license, uh, commercial real property tax. I personally think more can be done to collect real property tax. I would suggest the government, they hire a number of, of, of students from the College of the Bahamas, University of the Bahamas, put them in a real property tax department, let them go over the register of their, choose the high ranking, the outstanding, longest, biggest dollar sums for commercial businesses, go knock on their door and say, you know, this is the first charge on your property. We forget there was a time in the Bahamas where the government said to the banks, if the person doesn't pay the real property tax, the bank had to pay it and charge it to your mortgage because it is a first charge. It's the highest charge on your property. All you need to do is rattle that cage, and I'm sure a lot of people will come forward. And their debt will probably, most of the government debt, on, most of the debt on real property tax, commercial property, predates Dorian and COVID. Predates, so it, don't blame that they might have added to it. So the government does a very smart thing. It says we'll go to the tenants and we'll make it so the tenants have to pay some of this real property tax. There was nothing more egregious to me for employers who collect national insurance from persons' wages and then doesn't pay it to national insurance. Mm -hmm. And then the, 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 the employee gets sick and goes to health services and they say, no, no, your national insurance isn't paid. There's nothing more egregious than that. Mm -hmm. wow. It is wrong. And those persons should be paying, if they're collecting from the, the, the employee, they should be handing that money over to the government so the government can provide services for those who really need it. I already talked about, I talked about the, uh, the economic zones, the ab abolition of, of bat on school supplies and hurricane um, relief, re hurricane preparedness stuff. There's been grants, of uh, uh, relief tax relief for religious organizations. And if you go to page 56 and 57 of the budget, the list goes on, an incredible list of, of things that, that have happened in terms of tax relief and um, benefits. Um, let me just, sorry, I thought I had it here. Uh, 56 in the budget. Okay. Elimination of that on, on, on baby diapers, duty on infect, uh, um, disinfectants, construction equipment. You know, construction equipment in the last several years, several months has gone up dramatically in price. And also the availability is not there because of tremendous demand and lack of production. Um, sporting gear, elimination of duty on that. So we're held, I mean, the prime minister, the member for Kalani went on about all these things, uh, building supplies. And it's all here for everyone to see. So whilst there is a, a, a difficulty with revenue collection, there's a compassion about giving relief in those areas which it needs it, so every Bahamian can take advantage of it. So, Mr. Speaker, my message is very simple. Under the most trying and difficult times, economic, social times of the Bahamas, where a lot of persons are either unemployed, furloughed, suffering physically and otherwise, the strain on, on parents and children and everyone in this economy, a country, the minus-led administration has found it 
a way to develop a accelerate Bahamas as a plan that benefits all Bahamians, is compassionate, is caring, is understanding, so that we can grow this economy back to where we need to be. The member, member opposite called an election budget. If this is an election budget, Mr. Speaker, that is the most overreaching reason why Bahamians should vote FNM in the next election. This budget shows that the FNM have the true grit, the tenacity, the ability, and proven track record to manage this government against the backdrop of woulda, shoulda, coulda. He'll have his time and he'll obviously have things to say, but that's my opinion. We would have been far worse if. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, obviously from those comments in my wrap up, I will fully support the budget. I won't be one of these persons that doesn't stand up or say aye or walks out or whatever. I fully support the budget, what it intends to do. We as a country, have to get behind the program. We might not like what the member for Killarney is doing, but the track record has proven he's doing the right thing. The budget is, the bu and, and I'll repeat it again and again, the budget is in line with what they projected two years ago. The national debt and the, the, the deficit of the government deficit in the first several years of the FNM government was consistently coming down. As predicted, Dorian and, and COVID got in the way. Give the FNM government the next term, and you will see, in my opinion, that national debt come down. When national debt comes down, servicing the national debt comes down, which means more services, goods, and provisions could be made available for others, education, whatever, for the Bahamian people and those people that live in the Bahamas. That, Mr. Speaker, is good stuff, a true, compassionate, caring FNM government. Mr. Speaker, I just want to mention one thing before I sit down. And one of the append a lot of times the bills that are added on in the bundle, we never really look at. Well, we don't, we don't debate. I would just, and with permission of the honorable member for Yamacraw, like to draw attention to the immigration bill. That's another aspect to grow this economy. Because what the immigration bill does is the amendment, I think it's to clause 17, if I remember correctly, is widen the opportunity for permanent residents so that persons can invest in economic instruments in the Bahamas, whether it's the University of the Bahamas, whether whatever it is, not just own a home, but they can be own a home and invest. But it also adds the kicker, which is a very good clause, that every so often, I think it's every 10 years, you have to prove to the government you still have that investment. So you can't just come buy a house, get your permanent residence, sell the house tomorrow and disappear. You have to prove you maintain that benefit for the benefit of that investment for the benefit of the Bahamas. Very good aspect. Any of those that have seen a permanent residency card recently, and a lot of people have come and asked me, it says permanent residency expires 10 years from now, whatever, from the data when you get. And they look and say, well, why is that happening? It's to force you to come back into the Department of Immigration, bring your light bill, whatever it is, and prove you are still here. When I was Minister of Financial Services, I traveled around the world. I met many permanent residents. I said, where do you live in Nassau? Oh, I lived in Nassau for 20 years. But they got their permanent residence. We should not underestimate, when we look at direct foreign investment, the amount of investment that comes from permanent residents in the Bahamas. You only have to look, and it's been excelled by COVID. There are persons who want to get out of big cities, in the United States, they're buying property in Wyoming, and Utah, and all those way out. And a lot of people, I see it every day in my business, a lot of people are coming to the Bahamas and buying houses, not only in Nassau. I mean, you only have to go to Luthra. None of the members for Luthra are here. Um, but those property values are changing. Persons are living there. 
They're spending longer there. They're investing in the economy. So this particular amendment, I think, is well welcome. I would add, Minister, don't forget the tax information number part of the, part of the permanent residency, which has, has to come in, into that. Mr. Speaker, for those few words, it is a great pleasure for the member, my, for the member of St. Anne's to fully support the uh, budget communication 2021, and I hereby move that it be adopted. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. As many, the Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for North Abago. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, when I walked in this place this morning and I saw the Venerable Member from St. Anne's and realized that this would be perhaps his last bite at the budget communications and, and to debate in this place, as he's done for so many years, so exceptionally, I knew that he would be a tough act to follow. But Mr. Speaker, I'm sure at some point we're going to have an opportunity to, to really speak to people like the member for St. Anne's and others who, who will be leaving this place after this cycle of elections. You know, sitting in the, in the cabinet with him was always very exciting because he taught you, uh, he listened, and he chided when, when it was necessary as nascent uh, cabinet ministers. And so I don't know why anyone would take exception to his, to his teachings um, about how we should focus and, and, and listen at times rather than, than jumping in here first before we appreciate what we're dealing with. And so I, I want to congratulate him. Um, it's going to be, I guess, a very long time since we've had a seminar sitting in this place. Um, I mean, they're even on the wall. <laughs> but yeah, but 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 we but we appreciate but we appreciate that he's only a phone call away, and I and I told him that I believe a white will do him well in in this place. <laughs> <laughs> the speaker I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank my member of parliament, uh, the the member for Carmichael, uh, who whom I've known for many years. Um, for this wonderful gift that he has presented me this morning. Um, yeah, you, 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 you know, I might as well tell you, you got all four votes that I control, right? <laughs> <laughs> you got all four votes that I control in Michael, right? But it, it is beautiful and it represents uh, my community of North Abaco and I, I truly, truly appreciate it. Mr. Speaker, it, it, it it's always my distinct privilege and, and honor to rise in these hallowed halls on behalf of the people of North Abaco, whom I believe are the strongest, most determined, industrious, and resilient people in the whole world. I begin my contributions to this 2021-22 budget debate by giving thanks to Almighty God, who anchors, guides, directs, and keeps me in all that I do. He alone continues to be the source of my strength, only hope that I have in the life to come. Allow me please to extend condolences to Gary and Donna Hudson, the treasure key, who lost their son a couple of weeks ago in a, in a traffic accident. To cousin Alice Morley and her family on the passing of Eleanor Hill last week, who, who was mentioned by the Minister of Education as she was a teacher. And to Craig, and Purcell Cephas of Grand Key on the tragic death of their son on Friday, Friday past in Grand Key. The family also wanted me to extend their gratitude to the minister responsible for aviation um, who, who worked with us to try and get an emergency flight in there. But before uh, we were able to do so, he had succumbed. It was a rough time on the weekend. I also extend condolences to Douglas Evans and his family. Douglas is in Cooperstown and his family and the recent, recent passing of his parents, Lloyd and Mr. Evans. And to the families of Reverend Addison A. Turnquist and Mr. Stephanie Wells. You know, Father Turnquist used to be somewhat of a chaplain at the base in Coral Harbor when we were going through a very rough patch and he, he 
I think he, he witnessed right there in the Gambia community. And so he adopted us on the base and he came often just to spend time with us and we appreciate him. Um, of course, Mr. Stephanie Wells, a noted attorney in this country, who also passed, uh, as we've learned on the weekend. Um, we, we also send our condolences to her family. Her husband was a former member of our party um, and a prominent member in this place. We show the families of our prayers and, and continued support in this their hour of bereavement. Mr. Speaker, I'd also like to take this opportunity to congratulate the Right Honorable Dame Janet Boswick on receiving the 2021 CARICOM Triennial Award for Women, which recognizes yes. which recognizes our contributions to society. This most prestigious regional award, among other things, is given to Caribbean women who have distinguished themselves in socioeconomic development of the community and for advancing gender equality and women's empowerment. I have the privilege of personally congratulating Dame Boswick over the weekend, and I know that my colleague, the Minister for Social Services, who worked hard to achieve this prestigious honor, will speak more on it when he makes his contribution in this place. Mr. Speaker, on a personal note, my wife of 36 years, Deidre, whom we affectionately call today in my house, remains my North Star, who leads to the sanctuary and safety of the home, which she has built for my children and I over all these years. I honor my maternal grandmother, Anne Louise Cornish, and my mother, Evelyn Cornish, Enfield, both of whom have gone home to receive their eternal rewards. I honor them because they believed in me, they encouraged me, they prayed for me, and they loved me unconditionally. <coughs> my father, Bishop Clifford Henfield, taught me discipline and the values associated with being the leader of one's family. Dahlia, I must single her out because like my brother from South Beach, I wish I had her first. My granddaughter has caused me to love in a way that is novel to me. I thank the most honorable prime minister, Dr. Hubert Minnis, whom we affectionately have called Doc, for the trust he's reposed in me to speak on behalf of our beloved nation, both at home and abroad. It is not lost on me that mine is the most improbable journey. I guess that's why I don't have a sense of entitlement that many seem to struggle with in this place. You see, Mr. Speaker, I'm a little fellow from Dundas Town, Albuquerque. More specifically, Block 30. Went to Dundas Town Primary School, graduated from Abaco Central High School, and worked until I was old enough. And like so many other young Bahamians, I enlisted in the Royal Bahamas Defense Force. Following the incident of Flamingo in 1980, I joined in 1981. Simply put, I, like most of my generation, am shaped by independence and inspired by sacrifice and service. You know, Mr. Speaker, I heard a voice note the other day done by a person whose name I will not mention, indicating that we were rudderless and the ministry was in, in dire trouble. But you know, I have all my life saluted the Bahamian flag and revered the Constitution, never burned it. Never, never, never burned it. No, never, never, never did that. I, I served and sacrificed in the interest of the Bahamian people. And you know, the note was sent out on a day when we were, when we were supposed to be celebrating the, the honor of the lives lost, honoring the lives lost, in, in the Flamingo incident. But you know, that's the way the PLP treat those on Flamingo. Last time they called an election on that day. Mm -hmm. But you know what is so ironic? South Beach, four young Bahamian men were lost in that battle of Santa, Key Santo Domingo, four, yeah. and four of them survived. There's rich irony somewhere in that. Oh. And at some point, we're going to figure that out. Oh. 
And and you, you you hear that? I don't know. I don't normally play no no numbers. <laughs> but I'm advised too that the former prime minister lost by just four in Centerville. Oh, listen, man, if you can box four, box it. <laughs> uh, God, God forgive me. <laughs> you know, Mr. Speaker, while serving through the years, I attended Britannia Royal Naval College, College of the Bahamas, the University of the West Indies, and a Naval Postgraduate School. God has been good to me. I get to stand on the shoulders of consequential Bahamian pioneers and nationalists. And so every time, Prime Minister, I walk into my office at the ministry, I walk past the photographs of former ministers of foreign affairs, and each time I'm awed. I mean, think about it. On the wall is the Lyndon Penley. Also, the Honorable Paul L. Ali. Sir Clement Maynard. Dame Janet Boswick. And the most venerable, distinguished member from St. Anne's. That's pretty high caucus for a little boy from Block 30 in Dundestown. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, why it is important for leaders, well, if you'll permit me today, well, Doc, to, to traffic and hope. You know, I heard it, I heard it said in, in here last week that the budget was too much trafficking and hope. So, 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 so like like the member for St. Anne's, who went and looked up and researched a little on Alice in Wonderland, and, and we didn't speak about this, I went and I, I looked up hope. I looked up hope, and, and this is what Google says. I quote, hope is a feeling of expectation and desire for a particular thing, for a particular thing to happen. I didn't stop there, Mr. Speaker. You know, we we inclined to go look at the Bible, oh, yeah. people like, like us. And here's what the Bible says about hope. For I know the plans I have for you. <laughs> declares, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Now, if that didn't get your attention, here's what the great reformer, Martin Luther, says about hope. I know you would like this South Beach. He says, everything that is done in this world is done by hope. And so, Mr. Speaker, hope is a thing that we all need to look to the future. And in the FNM, and yeah. the leadership of Dr. Minnis, yeah. there is re reason yeah. to find hope yeah. in this country. Yeah. And now, like, like the member who spoke before me, I move this thing from behind and get loose here a little bit. <laughs> we, we need to put things in perspective. We need to put things in perspective. That brings me to where I think we all need to find ourselves from from time to time, in that place of establishing a perspective. And here's, here's what our perspective is. The backdrop to this budget that we debate in this place this week, it started last week. When we assumed office in May of 2017, we found, as indicated by the Prime Minister in his presentation last week, Wednesday, and I quote, imagine that even though it is hard to imagine, they left almost a billion dollars in unfunded bills and arrears that, kept, that were kept mostly hidden from the Bahamian people. And then you got the gumption, and, the, and then you got the gumption to come in here and lecture the FNM about transparency <laughs> and fiscal responsibility. Can you, can you, can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Nascent ministers, most of us, walking into our ministries and finding in the drawers bills in excess of $300 million. And you, 
you dare come in here and lecture us on transparency and accountability. Something got to be wrong with that. And then they tell the Bohemian people to ignore Hurricane Dorian, the worst of its kind in the history of Atlantic storms. You know what Hurricane Dorian did? Came and sat on Abaco and Grand Bahama for near three days. I know I was there. And left in its wake death, destruction, and too many disrupted lives to count. That's what it did. But the Bahamian electorate, I believe, Mr. Speaker, is astute, yes, yeah. and capable, yes. and perceptive. Yes. That's why the PLP were voted out in mass in 2017, and that's why it will not be voted in in the next general election. <laughs> this is Sri's number right here, Brian Rich. Only one survived in Nassau. Now, that one I... I was trying to figure out, you know, you, you like numbers like me to figure these things out, right? That one I was trying to figure out. But Mr. Speaker, apart from the human suffering, the sheer destruction and trauma Dorian left behind, the killer storm also left a price tag estimated at $3.4 or $3.5 billion. That cannot be ignored. How do you ignore that? How do you ask people to say that this government, to say to people that this government is merely making excuses, right. when you have all of the empirical information to support what we face. Right. I mean, you have it, right? So how do we simply ask the Bahamian people to just ignore that six months after Dorian, oh. a pandemic the likes of which the world had not seen in a hundred years, oh. called COVID-19, COVID came knocking on our shores. How do we ignore it? As you quite well know, Mr. Speaker, there was no playbook no. designed to respond to Dorian. None. I don't care what nobody says. I spent all my life in the military. military I was there. No playbook. The Prime Minister came down on the day before I was ahead of Dorian, and I wondered what he was doing because the sky had already begun to to turn dark. And, and he said, Darren, I came this last time to warn the people to prepare for what's coming. If I had a little bit more sense, I'd jump on that plane and come back with it. <laughs> but I couldn't. <laughs> right? Couldn't leave, couldn't leave my people. Right? And so you, you, there is no playbook to determine what to do when all of your plans that you have made sure start to cave in on you. All of the schools and the churches where we kept people, where we normally traditionally keep people in such events, implored. And thank God Dorian came in the daylight because daylight hours cost us to save a lot of lives. Because we could see people coming from the four winds, four corners of the earth, coming toward that government complex and making their way toward the health care center. There's no playbook. Only improvise. But you know what? I'm glad we had Doc at the wheel. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. Hindsight is always 2020. Yeah, I'm recording. Everybody could see good in the back. Everybody could see good in the back. And, and you know, and, and you know, this, this, this one always gets to me, Saudi. So you know what it really gets to me? They come into this place where we ought to tout our plan. For four years, I watched this and say that we have no plan. But I'm yet to see their plan. Plan for COVID, plan for Dorian, plan for the economy, plan for the future. They have none. And so they spend all of their time criticizing and down, down trotting. You ain't got no plan for Kerala, no man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you ain't got no plan for Kerala, and you want you got plan for the country? You can load up the plane, you're testing the right, let's go. Let me, let me try and move on. <laughs> Not only did the pandemic bring our touristic dependent economy, Mr. Speaker, to a halt, but, but before we get there, let's, 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 in retrospect, let's look at this. Tourism. To that point, had seen as brightest days 
in the modern history of the Bahamas. We had registered some 7 million plus tourists. That happened, that happened, under, that happened under, under, under his administration. 7.2 million. And Dorian took out the last three months. That, 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 that's what happened. You know, here, here, here's, here's also what happened since you, since, you, since you say what Dorian took out, my brother Wells. They have no plan for Grand Bahama Eden. I know the Grand Bahamian members of Parliament can speak to this because this is something we cannot let them forget. We cannot let Grand Bahamians know, forget, that they wanted us to allow the hotel, La Lucaya, to go to the wind. Yeah, what, which, which hotel that was printed? That was on their watch? What did, what did they do? Allowed it to close, allowed it to close with some fanciful idea that the economy would rebound. And then they assail us for buying the airport. Everything that we do for the, the Grand Bahamian people to give them hope and a future, they assail. And then they go to Grand Bahama and tell them, trust me again. Everything. You know, sometimes when I go to Grand Bahama, I put on some, some flip flops and short pants and t-shirts and I walk out. I walk out, I, I believe, I believe it with, um, What's an aunt should have, should have referred to as the Cheshire Cat, always grinning, yeah. and don't know why. Always grinning, the Cheshire Cat, right? And don't know why. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, let, let, me, let, me, let me tell you what the international community thinks of this administration. In his press release of the 1st of June 2020 entitled, IMF Executive Board Approves U.S. 250 million disbursement to the Bahamas to address COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic, the IMF stated the following. Forgive me as I, as I do this, because I believe we need perspective. And I quote, the Bahamas was just recovering from the widespread destruction caused by Hurricane Dorian in the fall of 2019, when the pandemic led to a sudden stop in tourism, generating sizable fiscal and external financing needs. The economic outlook remains subject to an unusually high degree of uncertainty. The authorities' policy response to COVID-19 crisis is appropriate. This is what, you know, Kalani, there's a scripture in the Bible that you must always remain cognizant of. A prophet is always without honor in his own town. at home. So it take it take the people from outside sometimes to come and and prophesy. Fine, Rich, you agree with me. And so the authorities' policy response to COVID nineteen crisis is appropriate, is what they said, including the timely adoption of targeted fiscal measures to boost health spending, support jobs and vulnerable segments of the population. And once the present crisis subsides. Significant and determined fiscal consolidation will be needed to achieve the targets specified under the Fiscal Responsibility Act. That's what they said. We, 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 didn't, we didn't just conjure that up. That's what they said. Mr. Speaker, United Nations Development Program missive or document dated 2020 and entitled UNDP LAC C19 PDS number 16. The Bahamas country note impact of COVID-19 and policy options. And you can find it in that document on page eight, and it reads as follows. You can just Google these things so I can lay it. I quote, this pandemic comes at a time the country is rebuilding from the devastating cost of Hurricane Dorian in September 2019. Nonetheless, the Bahamas is in a better position to develop an emergency response to the crisis and reduce its impact on poverty and unemployment than most of the countries in the region. Here, here, here is what, here's what I found very interesting, and I continue. The country has shown sustained growth over the last years, and the government has improved fiscal compliance. That's this administration. 
They said over the last year, that was 2018. Yeah. And, and let, me, let, me, let me repeat that. The country has shown sustained growth over the last years, and the government has improved fiscal compliance. Yeah. Couldn't, be, couldn't, 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 couldn't be them that they're talking about. Had to have been us. They know how to work drawers. They don't know how to work fiscal compliance. How to hide things in drawers. That's what they know how to do. That's what they know how to do. How to hide things in drawers. No, man. No, man. Draw drawers. 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 That's drawers. That's drawers. However, poverty is still prominent, especially among scattered islands, and unemployment is around 10%. In the face of long-term recession, the government needs to reevaluate the social spending strategy, shifting help from food assistance to a wider unemployment coverage than resource households most in need. The country should invest in improving social statistics, registration, and all the rest of it. That's what we've done in this budget. We've listened to the technocrats and the experts, and we have invested more money in social services, more money toward Unemployment assistance. You know, I heard, I heard someone on, on, on the television last night, and I could not believe it. Say, we need to get on the ground. Say, we need to get on the ground and feel, oh, 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 man, who are we fooling? No government has done more in the history of this country in social service assistance than this present administration. None. Mr. Speaker, let me just do one more from the World Bank. There's a press release dated May 25th of May. It's more current. 25th of May, 2021. It's entitled World Bank approves US 100 million for the Bahamas' COVID-19 response and recovery. And we find the following here, and I quote, the COVID-19 pandemic came on the heels of the devastation, devastation caused by Hurricane Dorian, said to Shane Saeed, World Bank, country director for the Caribbean. The Bahamas has suffered one of the most severe economic contractions in the Caribbean. This World Bank assistance will contribute to the country's efforts to reduce vulnerabilities of citizens most impacted by the crisis and support policy and institutional measures for a resilient recovery. That's what we've been about. In the face of Dorian, in the face of the COVID-19 pand pandemic, we have been busy trying to take care of the vulnerable, trying to, to keep people employed, trying to keep people in a place of hope yeah. that we're going to come out of this thing on the backside of it. And when we come out, we're going to have a better and a brighter future yeah. under the leadership of Doc. You know, I don't, I don't mind you disagreeing with us and, and our policy initiatives, but, but if you ain't got none, you should be quiet. <laughs> I mean, unless you got something to set ours aside. And, and, but, Mr. Speaker, I realize that in the face of the challenges, despite all of the challenges, you know, Sinan's touched on many things. Most of the things that we did, in the face of the challenges, it's, it's like, it's unbelievable. Most of the important things in the world, Mr. Speaker, have been accomplished by people, and this is, this is Dale Carnegie, who have kept on trying when there seemed to be no hope at all. I read somewhere that it's our reaction to adversity and not adversity itself which determines our outcome. Mr. Speaker, you know, during the past four years, I've had a bird's eye view of the reactions of, of Kalani. As he faced the type of challenges not seen by any political leader in the recent history of our country. You see, it is impossible to contextualize our fiscal disposition in the Bahamas to date without serious consideration of three very catastrophic events upon which we find ourselves, the backdrop, so be, for where we are. 
I mentioned two of them already. Well, I mentioned three of them. But you know, I, I named them. Hurricane Dorian, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the failed PLP, which preceded them. It's impossible to, to, to truly appreciate where you are, what your disposition is, without dealing with these three things. That said, Mr. Speaker, despite the triple calamitous happenings with which this administration has been forced to contend, yet underpinned by policy vision to make our nation a more consolidated archipelago, that's our policy vision. Early days in the cabinet, the prime minister said to us, you know, early days, life on the family islands should be perceived as no different than life in the cities. In Nassau and, and in Grand Bahama. I want everything that is available in Nassau and Grand Bahama to be made available to the people on the farm. That was music to my head. That was music to my ears as an island boy that here we had a leader just as interested in family islanders as he was in those who populated our metropolitan areas. And that's our policy vision. Let me, let me just read it again. A policy vision to make our nation a more consolidated archipelago, which provides equality and services from Enagua to Walker's Key. And we have been able to get some things done based on this vision, Mr. Speaker. We've been able to get some things done. Here's what we did first. As Hurricane Irma approached in 2018, you all remember Hurricane Irma? 2017. A policy decision to take care of the family islands was made. And the Prime Minister ordered the evacuation of Southern Islands in this country. Never been done before. Never been done before. I don't, I, you know, you know, I shudder, I shudder to think how many lives may have been lost because we know um, some of the structures in the Southern Islands are not so well appointed as, as others we might find in, in other places in our country. And I was, I was so happy and pleased to see that people in the Southern Islands of the Bahamas took advantage of that and came to New Providence where they found safety and succor until we, we were able to return them along with the, 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 the MP for that area, Michael, back to their homes. But well, they Bahamians, you know, they, they yeah. Bahamians, they, they, this, this, all of you is one. And then if they want to stay here, that's fine, you know? Here, here is another thing that happened under this leadership. You heard the member for Kalani say it. We actually, KP the turn quest, we actually were able to reduce the deficit. Under the leadership of Kalani, Doc, we brought unemployment down to a number we had not seen in the recent history of this country. We grew tourism to historical numbers. We made historical strides in the fight on crime. Historical strides. We delivered free attendance to the University of the Bahamas, Minister of Education. And we, but you know, you know what I really like about this whole thing? We gave Palm Island students under, under the direction of Doc. I know you don't mind me calling you that today. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me lose myself in here today. Lose me, lose me. We supported Family Island students that attended UV with $500 in subsistence. To help them. A month, a month. They could tell me, if they could, if they could tell me right now what they did for UB students on the family island, potentially I'll sit right down. You know, you know, you know, Minister of Education, you know what you know what that where their plans are for UB students from the family islands in the pipeline. In the pipeline, in the pipeline, in the pipeline, in the pipeline. No water, no water to push it through. But we putting water in the pipelines now, though. We put water in the pipelines right now. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, 
No disrespect intended, but Doc determined that he would not furlough any civil servant. Not a single civil servant. How many? It does not. Say, say we should have downsized. That's what his plan was, downsize it. Mr. Speaker, under the leadership of Kalani, we dispersed more than 259 million in the war on COVID. 259 million. I don't have, I know the Minister of Health will go through what we did. How much? Uncle, Uncle Fee say if a man was a king, he could do almost anything. But to count that kind of money, I don't know what to do. A quarter billion, a quarter of billion dollars. And they say we had no plan. They say we had no plan. Nearly 39 million to feed our people. And we have to say these things because we have to have perspective. When they get out there and say we need to get on the ground. And when they get out there and say we don't care about people. When they get out there and say we are visionless. And we have no plan. Well, if this ain't no plan, I don't know what a real plan looks like. 44.4 million in support of businesses. And you know, this may seem a little difficult for some people to appreciate. But the businesses in this country employ Bahamians too. And when we subsidize and support these businesses in this way, we are actually providing for the jobs of Bahamians. That's the vision. That's the plan. The future of the Bahamas is the plan. I've heard it said, I can't remember who said it, man. Tough times don't last. That's who it was, the great Robert Shuler. But tough people, they do. 53.3 million to support entrepreneurs. New businesses, new ideas to step into an economy to help infuse capital where there is none existing. You know, one of the ancillary impacts positive that we had of the COVID-19 was when the Prime Minister determined that we wouldn't import masks unless they were of a certain type. I can't remember, I can't recall the amount of businesses that sprang up in this country developing masks and participating in the economy in the way that that happened. But a number of them do, did, and they're very creative at it. They're very good at making these masks. Prime Minister, appreciating that in order to include the family islands, we had to be able to operate in, in the digital divide. And so instructed the government to digitize its services, to provide more ready access to Bahamians all across this beautiful archipelago. In the result, we are still standing in the breach for those who can't stand for themselves. And we will not stop until the future of every behemoth is secure. That is our prayerful hope. That is our hope. Mr. Speaker, I want our Bacornians to know that their future is extremely bright. Their future is secured under this government. Don't know what they can get under any other. Abaco will be bigger. It will be better. It will be stronger and more resilient because of Hurricane Dorian. You know, when others saw calamity and destruction and chaos, there, there were some of us who saw tremendous opportunities. And so despite the naysayers, and admittedly the amount of work left to be done, Abaco is on the mend and poised 
to go to the next level. I believe that. Let me say that the government's policy to allow the continuance of the, the search in order to, to ease the burden of the already burdened people in Abaco and Grand Bahama is a clear indication that we recognize that the full recovery of the economy of the Bahamas cannot and will not be realized without the strength and vibrancy that Abaco and Grand Bahama brings to the table. Yeah. We recognize that. I'm advised, you know, that, that FEMA, the Federal Emergency Agency, and, and the U.S. asserts that it takes 15 years for a yet developing country to recover after an event such as, as Dorian. But I say, I say to FEMA, with no disrespect, that won't happen in the Bahamas. That won't happen in the Bahamas. So on the road to recovery, in tandem with the government's objectives to achieve the accelerated Bahamas recovery plan toward achieving the seven core priorities. That's where we are. We're on the road. And, he, and, and, and I want to repeat these priorities. Job creation, small business development, health care improvement, vaccinations, tourism, public and private sector investment, digitization and innovation, and fiscal responsibility. Those are the seven pillars on which we will build a better, brighter, more prosperous Abaco and Grand Bahama in the future. We in Abaco, Mr. Speaker, are not just poised to recover, but to thrive in a post-Dorian, post-pandemic Bahamas. We will do so through home construction, through commerce, through education, through commercialization of our air and seaports, through food security initiatives, and through sheer innovation. Mr. Speaker, everywhere I go in North Abaco, and I meet with young people, most of them have one singular thing in mind. And I, I, I suppose it's still a part of what we call the Bahamian dream. It's land and home ownership. That's what they speak to me about. That's what the young people of this country want. And that's why we've implemented a, a policy from Anagua in the south to Abaco in the north, that we will put land in the hands of young Bahamians yeah. to give them the opportunity to own a piece of the Bahamian dream. Home ownership is what young people desire to own land in their own homes. And they need to, to be given that opportunity. And we realize that, and that's why we're doing it. Early on, we identified three potential sites in Abaco to develop the type of communities the Prime Minister envisioned. Early on, these include Central Pines, an area, in an area more westerly toward Murphy Town, the South Side Road area. You know that area? In Spring City. In Wilson City. Now, here, yeah. yeah, yeah, you did spend some time. You did spend some time there. You did spend some time there. All right. Now, here, here, here is the vision. I want you all to pay attention to the vision. And I want the young people to hear. The government will provide the land, put in the infrastructure, and then give it to you at cost. Now, that's what that's what docs say, you know. Docs say less than cost. So 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 if the land is twenty valued at twenty thousand, say say this land we're looking at here now, and the cost of putting in the infrastructure uh, to each tenant is approximately five thousand, and we go less than cost, and in my mind, I think in fifty percent. That's what I think in my mind. I mean, I mean, if if, if anybody wants, I'm thinking fifty percent. So I'm so I'm so I'm thinking Pine Ridge that a, 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 a piece of property to put your house on will cost a young Bohemian family $2,500 for the property. Now, for $2,500 for the property, that leaves you equity of how much? 17,500? That leaves you equity of about 17,500 where you can take your land paper 
and land is well, you know. Let me trying to put wealth in the hand of young Bahamians. Land is wealth, you know. When you can take your land, paper to a lending institution that is approved, yeah. and say, here's my land, deeds, I have 17,500 in equity. I'm talking to, to the young people in Murphy Town. I'm talking to young people in Dundas Town and in Central Pines and in Crown Haven and Lynn Labaco. I'm talking to the young people in Treasure Key and Grand Key. You, 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 hear, you hear the dog just telling me? Abaco and Grand Bahama, because of the devastation, gets a further 50% reduction. I wish I could get some water here, quick, please. And so, and so if we have if we have an approved lending institution, and this way, this way it comes in, you know, when we talk about a private sector involvement in the, in the government private sector involvement in the country and what we do. All we need is a good private partner in this environment to come to housing and say to them, listen, I want to invest in these communities. I'm willing to make available this amount of funding to, to develop the community in Murphy Town or in Central Pines or in Spring City. This is how you secure the future of young Bahamians. This is our plan. This is our vision. This is his vision for the young people of the Bahamas. Yeah. Yeah. Now, separately from that, from the, the mentioned identified sites, the, you know, these service law communities, we call them, through potential uh, uh, public-private partnerships, as envisioned by the Prime Minister. The DRA has already cleared the proposed site for the building of homes donated by the Baker's Bay Group. And it is anticipated, I talked to the contractor yesterday, it is anticipated that construction on the five model homes in that community will commence within the next two to three weeks. Now, I'm sure there are going to be more than 50 homes. I'm almost positive of that. And these homes will be given to Bahamians whose homes were destroyed who lost their homes in the storm, will be given to them free, free, grants, no payments, gratis. And this is about to start. And so when you talk about the future of Abaco, I have reason to be optimistic. I have reason to be optimistic. I'm also pleased to say that the Ministry of Housing through the government's service lot land initiative is poised to replicate its Carmichael initiative in Central Pine poised to do it, chopping at the bits to do it. It will happen soon. It is contemplated that that development of some 60 will, will include some 60 homes, and, 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 and that's, that's, that's more homes for, for young Bahamians, for young Abaconian families. And grand Bahamians, plenty of Grand Bahamians in Abaco too, you know, apparently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, 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 we share. A lot of things in common in the north. 60 homes. Phase one of the project will an anticipate the building of 20 homes. Will commence, we hope, before the end of the summer. And so, Mr. Speaker, the dream of home ownership for the young people in Abaco, where we need housing uh, more than ever since Dorian, is very close at hand. And it will materialize in short order. Mr. Speaker, our ongoing recovery and restoration efforts, we appreciate right at the outset that the government alone, despite its best efforts, could not, cannot repair all of the damage visited upon us by Dorian. No, 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 no one single, no one single government could. Oh, I mean, I mean, you know, and you, it's one thing, it's one thing to, to, to denigrate people who are trying to give people hope, but it's another thing to peddle nonsense. Another thing to peddle nonsense. When you tell people, but what, the government ain't do this, and the government ain't do that. The government has been with us from day one in Abaco. We know that. We thank God for the NGOs that came in abundance. We thank God for our friends and our neighbors. That's what happens in times of disaster. 
people come to your aid and your, and your succor and to your assistance. And that's what happened all across Abaco, happened all across Grand Bahama. And we thank God for it. Every day, we give God thanks for it. It's all ongoing efforts to recover, especially in the midst of the war on COVID. It's going. Permit me just to say here that this minutes-led administration through the operations of the disaster authority, the DRA, is committed to ensuring that every homeowner that has been assessed and approved by the mechanisms employed by that agency will receive the assistance promised by this government. We will receive the assistance. So, if you've had your damage assessed, 7,000, you got 2,500, the rest of your money coming to you. It's coming to you in very short order. I know that my colleague, the minister from Western and, and, and Bimini, who has responsibility for the DRE, will speak more to this notion when she presents in this place. So along with what we have been doing as a collective, with the aid and assistance of donors, and this is just us now, this is us as a member of parliament for North, for North Abaco, along with the aid and assistance of our donors from at home and, and abroad, I will continue to help in our efforts toward full recovery. You know, South Beach, we've been able, by the grace of God, to, to support a tremendous amount of rebuilding efforts. Um, the Prime Minister's office, uh, with his with his support, we were able to we were able to to, to get a, a a brand new house in in Blackwood. Um, we were able to assist another family in, in, in Blackwood with with the, the construction of their home, one in Mount Hope. Um, we, we 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 spread all across, you know, Pine Ridge. Um, another one in Crown Haven, right? We're looking at some. Some other, some other structures that we we're gonna, we we're gonna get help with, uh, in Grand Key. And this, this, they could, they could do something to do, you know. Instead of just going around lamenting what ain't happening, as a party, they could do something too. Ain't nobody, ain't nobody stopping you from making a donation toward uh, the rebuilding of homes. But ain't no interest in that. Ain't no interest in that. Two, so, Mr. Speaker, a much welcome initiative, which is being dubbed Operation Work Speed, which is intended to augment and not compete with existing governmental and, and private restoration efforts in Abaco, more help is underway. In the first instance, the program will, will focus on those in need of labor and others in need of material. Thus far, some 95 plus homes have been assessed as to their existing needs, and it is anticipated that, that five of these homes will be addressed and, and one way or the other within the next two weeks. I wish I could say who was helping us with this, but I'm not at liberty to say so at the moment. Mr. Speaker, commercial development in Abaco is key to the future of Abaco. Whilst Baker's Bay, Winding Bay, and the Keys appear to be rebounding nicely, there are several major investments at the gate that are being finalized. From Hole in the Wall in the south to Walker's Key in the north, and almost everywhere in between. I see, I see my brother from Southern Central nodding. Abaco is set for a boom period, the likes of which it has not seen since the early days of Treasure Key and those types of developments. The, the Tyroys Family Holding Limited Group, 300 million investment in, in the Marino development in South Abaco. 300 million. We went down there with the Prime Minister and signed that, that heads of agreement. I'm advised that the land clearing is scheduled to, to commence very shortly, and we're looking forward to that. The Sterling Montage Key Limited, 352.2 million marina property development investment on Matlow's Key in Central Abaco is scheduled to begin. Infrastructural works in a few weeks, I'm advised. Treasure Key Beach Marina and Gulf Resort. And told is under contract, and we look optimistically to the future of that community. 
Mr. Speaker, I am seaports. There are tremendous interests in, in I am seaports in Abaco. And I'm certain that my colleague, the minister with responsibility for airports, will speak to the government's plans for the Treasury Gains International Airport, Leonard A. Thompson International Airport, uh, when he contributes to this debate. Moreover, there have been several expressions of interest relative to the private operations of the Marsh Harbor and the Cooperstown ports, seaports. Mr. Speaker, food security and diversification of the economy. Uh, my brother with responsibility for agriculture and fisheries is actively pursuing ways and means of, of moving our country toward food security. You know, Abaco has an active farming community and possesses some 48,000 acres of arable farmland, of which just 17,000 acres are in use. You know, when I was a boy, I remember we used to be very heavily involved in exporting yeah. cucumbers and tomatoes. And then we moved on to citrus from Abaco. And so I'm sure we can, we can reach those levels again. The Minister of Education assures me that, that technical education will take a priority in Abaco, and we see the need of it, the need for it nowhere more since, since Doria. With all of the developments that we have, we have to find a way of, in, of engaging our young people so that we don't have to continue to import labor to help us to rebuild. Yeah. Capital Works, Mr. Speaker, and ancillary efforts, post Dorian, Capital Works, and Albaco are progressing despite the economic climate in which we find ourselves. The sea walls to secure the shorelines of Dundastown and Pelican Shores are very much near completion. The Little Albaco Bridge, valued in excess of $5 million, is pretty much well underway, but due to COVID-19 pandemic, much needed technical expertise to move the project towards final stages has been delayed. I'm very pleased to report, Mr. Speaker, that the Grain Turkey dump site, which has been a source of immeasurable consternation to me and the residents of that lovely little island is soon to be completed. Upon completion, it will simply be a transfer station operation where waste is transported to the mainland for disposal. It is our hope that all such sites from Grand Key to Snake Key are similarly converted in the years to come. Ministry of Works has either completed or in the process of completing the necessary scopes of work to effect much needed repairs and refurbishment to all of our docks that were drastically impacted by Hurricane Dorian. Mr. Speaker, we're losing far too many young people on the streets and the highways of, of Abaco. Too many traffic accidents. And so very shortly, we will embark upon a road safety campaign towards sensitizing road users to exercise more caution and care on the roads and the highways. Well, because we're in the process right now of securing some much needed cat eyes that will help us to navigate the Sherland Boodle Highway and, and the Ernest Dane Highway as we, as we go forward into the future. With that, Mr. Speaker, I leave my constituency, my beloved island of Abaco, and I move now to report on the ministry for which I have charged. Over the last four years, it has been the mantra of the ministry to engage all and sundry with the view of enhancing the economy and security of the Bahamas. It is my view that we have done relatively well in this regard. Permit me to thank my permanent secretary, Mr. Peter DeVoe Isaacs, for his constant guidance and sage advice, my Director General Sharon Brennan Haylock for her attention to details, an ambassador at large, Dr. Kenya Ward, who works with me and keeps me on course, and all of the other hardworking emissaries and officers of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, both at home and abroad. I thank them for their commitment to excellence and service to this country that we all love. I believe that the country is fortunate to have such a diverse group of Bahamians whose sole purpose for existence is to achieve the best possible outcome for this nation and its people. Mr. Speaker, I'd also like to especially thank my colleague, my friend, my adopted little brother, His Excellency Ruben Raming, our ambassador to CARICOM. In this role, the Member of Parliament for Pinewood has been a complete team player, substituting where necessary and always sticking to the game plan. His performance has been nothing short 
of Stella. I thank you, my brother. I thank you, my brother. I begin with training. Training and development in the Foreign Service in this era of the pandemic remained current, dynamic, and critical. This had to be done through many innovations, but they proved highly beneficial, resulting in more staff being trained at little to no cost. We seized the opportunities for our officers to participate in a range of workshops and seminars that were offered by esteemed institutions, including the University of the West Indies, Foreign Service Institute, the United Nations, the Organization of American States, and others. We have some brilliant young officers in the ministry. And they, they were all able to attend seminars and, and, and host seminars, and they invited guest speakers from diverse sectors. No, no longer will you find a, a foreign service where you, where you just hire people for the sake of hiring people without the proper qualifications to send them all over the world. No, long, no, longer, no longer will you find that. Yeah, that used to happen. That used to happen. That used to happen. Mm. But when we, when we send young people all over the world to represent this country, we want them to be qualified. And we want them to be able to speak effectively. So, so what the Bahamas is all about. And to protect the interest of the Bahamas. And we've been able to, to do that. Mr. Speaker, more than 30 partner countries and organizations have offered technical assistance to the Bahamas during the year 2021. Due to the pandemic, such offerings come in the form of virtual courses and virtual seminars and, and workshops. The office are open to persons in both the public and the private sector. The ministry simply acts as a conduit between facilitators and applicants desirous of taking advantage of seeking to participate in these short-term online courses and scholarships. I've instructed that we find a way of, of informing the general public of the opportunities available so that they too, those who are not in the public service, they too can take advantage of these education opportunities. Mr. Speaker, appointments and postings and recalls a number of recalls and old postings of foreign service officers were anticipated during 2020 and 2021, but were deferred because of financial constraints and the lockdown of global borders. Of note, however, were the appointments of His Excellency Kenneth Russell, who replaced His Excellency Alvin Smith as High Commissioner in Canada. A High Commissioner Smith is to be commended for his sterling service to the Bahamas during his court duty. <laughs> High Commissioner Smith was in Canada at the height of the pandemic, and he spared no effort to assist the Hamans. His Excellency Captain Whitfield Neely retired, will replace His Excellency Godfrey Williams as Ambassador to Haiti. I thank Ambassador Williams, who was often forced to go over and beyond the call of duty to achieve the desired outcome. His Excellency Chet Nemo replaced Her Excellency Sheila Carey as Ambassador and Permanent Representative to the United Nations. Ambassador Carey served with distinction a, a public service officer extraordinaire. She served her country with distinction in her post in New York, and we wish her well upon the time. In addition to these movements, foreign service officers were posted in jurisdictions where the needs were critical, namely Haiti, Geneva, and New York. The pandemic has prevented most in-person farewell and first-time arrival calls on the ministry by foreign envoys. Nevertheless, we were able to resume this function with a new normal. And so in the past year, virtual meetings were held for the purposes of receiving copies, the usage from the new ambassadors of Austria, France, Israel, Qatar, Indonesia, Egypt, Denmark, Argentina, European Union, and the High Commissioners of Canada, India, Nigeria, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and the Secretary General of the Association of Caribbean States, and the UN Resident Coordinator. Using this platform, we've also said farewell to the outgoing Ambassador of Romania. We anticipate 
virtual presentations by envoys from Japan and Norway. We also welcome in person the recently arrived Ambassador of China, the Charge Affairs of the United States of America, and said, well, said farewell in person to the Ambassador of Italy. Mr. Speaker, the government of the Bahamas, since becoming an independent nation, has appointed 36 honorary consuls in various parts of the world. The purpose for appointing these persons is to promote the, the Bahamas and assist Bahamians in distress where the government had no representation either by way of a mission or our tourist office. These appointments have, for the most part, truly shown their importance during this era of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has caused so many of our nationals to be displaced all around the world. We have recently completed a review of existing honorary councils, and in the result, we've made several changes. Currently, there are 24 honorary councils, with the latest appointed in Detroit, Michigan, uh, Dr. William Picard, a noted Afro-American academic, businessman, and philanthropist. Mr. Speaker, meetings, technical consultations, and, and candidatures during the current fiscal year, travel to international meetings and conferences, was, for obvious reasons, suspended. The virtual space, however, enabled our participation in the global community. We also supported the work of other ministries in virtual meetings related to health, agriculture, education, sustainable development goals, and security. Through the virtual medium, we participated in the work of CARICOM, the OAS, and the community of Latin American states, CELAC, and the United Nations. Our active participation included chairing the 50th OAS General Assembly earlier this year. In this context, I'm also pleased to report that the Bahamas joined the rest of CARICOM in electing its first female Secretary General, Dr. Carla Barnett of Belize, Dr. Barnett is highly competent and possesses the skills, we believe, to navigate the region, the community, through the current economic fallout and challenges stemming from the COVID-19 pandemic and those associated with climate change. I also take this opportunity to wish, on behalf of the Prime Minister and the Government of the Bahamas, if I may do so, sir, to wish the outgoing Secretary General of CARICOM, His Excellency Irvin LaRook, the very best possible future who retired, he, he retired from that office as Secretary General. Uh, Ambassador Roque was fastidious in his protection of the community, which he served to the utmost with dignity and diplomatic aplomb. Mr. Speaker, international organizations, the government of the Bahamas' relationship with resident international organizations is very good. It's a very good standing, and these organizations include the OAS, the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation um, on Agriculture, ACRE, which I'm soon to announce uh, gave us, I think, and I haven't, I haven't yet spoken to the Minister of Agriculture about this, as to how we will do it. I think they, they're providing for us some 100 uh, scholarships toward developing agriculture in the Bahamas. The Inter-American Development Bank, the IDB, the Pan-American Health Organization, Power Caribbean Agriculture Research and Development Institute, CARDI, the United Nations, High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, an international organization for migration. In May of this year, the UN Resident Coordinator opened an office in the Bahamas, having a resident presence, makes a difference in a country's relationship with an organization. And so by way of illustration, I refer to the OAS, where during the part of 2021, the Organization of American States approved seed funding through Development Cooperation Fund 2021 through 2024 cycle to support our national, multinational initiative, to strengthen institutional and human resources capacity, and to promote triangular and South-South cooperation. The Bahamas has put forward candidatures for this year for re-election to the Council of the International Maritime Organization, um, an election to the Council for United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO. And normally, we would launch an extensive campaign of lobbying countries and holding social events to guarantee election to, to bodies such as this. However, operating under the new normal, the campaigns have resulted in virtual, in the virtual space, uh, proving cost effective and impactful, yet impactful. We want to express gratitude, Mr. Speaker, um, to the many regional and international agencies and non-governmental organizations like 
the World Health Organization, Pan American Health Organization, PAHO, the Caribbean Public Health Agency, CARFA, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, SEDEMA, who provided assistance in the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian and continue to assist our rebuilding efforts <coughs> and fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Speaker, the procurement of vaccines, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs continues to serve as an intermediary for the procurement of COVID-19 vaccines and essentially essential medical supplies through our bilateral relations. At this time, I extend my sincere thanks and appreciation to our regional hemispheric and international counterparts for their donations and continue continued support during these challenging times. Once again, I highlight the kindness of the government of India for the generous donation of 20,000 AstraZeneca vaccines, which we use to commence our vaccination campaign in earnest. No, Mr. Speaker, I too have had my two doses, as well as, as, as my wife, and we're fine, and we, we appreciate that. When Bahamians, more Bahamians to take the vaccine um, will benefit, we believe, the outcome of the country. As we struggle to come through these tough economic environments, we, we feel like, we feel that tourists who, 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 who are wishing to travel to the Bahamas will do so more readily. And they know that, that we have done, taken all of the necessary steps to keep them safe and protected while they are in our country. And so the, 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 the essential thing is that the Bahamians who, who wish to see the economy of the Bahamas to rebound and to become as vibrant as it used to be, as it once will be again, um, that we should all move toward herd immunity. And, and, yeah. And, and, and we believe that the process of vaccination will help us to get there. We really believe that. The interest that we see, I know the Minister of Tourism will, will speak to this, but the interest that we see uh, in, in the traveling community outside of the Bahamas interested in coming here in this pent-up COVID frustrated environment is, is very encouraging. And um, the more of us do our part to, to help this economy to get going again, the better I believe would be for all of us. We are optimistic that the Bahamas will be a part of the United States' promise to make vaccines available to the region, and even more specifically, this country. And we thank Governor Scott, um, formerly uh, Governor, now Senator Rick Scott. Uh, we thank Senator Marco Rubio, and we thank also the Black Caucus in the United States for for their well their their in, in, insistence. That the Bahamas be considered uh, right out of the gate. Uh, what, those, what those two members recognize is, is that the, the economy of South Florida and, and the economy of the Bahamas are inextricably linked, and, and that we, if we can get our economy moving again, it's, it, it pushes life into their economy, um, which in this depressed environment all across the globe is, is, is much needed. And so we thank them for their, uh, their efforts to impress them. In preparing for, for, for the current hurricane season in which we're in, my ministry has again taken a proactive approach and requested humanitarian assistance ahead of any event uh, from the international community. And we found this to be very effective uh, in the wake of Dorian, where we did not have to wait on the, the regular diplomatic channels because we had done the legwork ahead of time to ensure that assistance came uh, after an event. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs continues to collaborate with the Ministry of Disaster Preparedness and Management and Reconstruction, the National Emergency Agency, NEMA, and the international community with respect to disaster preparedness and response. Once again, I express sincere gratitude to our international partners, particularly India and the United States of America for their generous donations of essential items, which will further enhance our response to catastrophic events. And expressing thanks, and expressing thanks to our international friends, I equally thank the brothers and sisters of the diaspora our knowledge and engagement with, with the Bahamian diaspora is further enhanced during this pandemic and particularly during the closure of our borders and their borders. The pandemic caused many within the diaspora to register with our overseas offices for the first time, thereby increasing the respective databases of the Bahamas and our overseas missions. Mr. Speaker, we are still working on our maritime delimitations mandate given to us by the Prime Minister 
with those neighboring countries that we've not yet signed agreements with. Um, at the end of 2019, the Maritime Limitation Committee was in the final stages of discussions with the United States on the holding of the fourth round of negotiations aimed at, at coming to some joint arrangement in the northern sector of our maritime space. And, and these negotiations, which had been tentatively scheduled for, for early 2020, of course, had to be deferred because of the coronavirus. Similarly, and for the same reason, plans to initiate discussions with the Republic of Haiti and the United Kingdom with regards to Turks and Caicos Islands were also put on hold. The committee, however, through the Maritime Division is actively seeking to re-engage the US and the UK. You know, Mr. Speaker, I'll, I'll report that uh, last weekend I had a conversation with the, the new Premier of the Turks and Caicos, and he's as anxious as we are uh, to get the arrangement, the agreement done between our countries, which will allow our maritime resources to patrol further south, thus uh, protecting the southern quadrant of the Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos from the issue of migrants, the migrant issues that they face as well as the other maritime law enforcement issues that they face. And I assured him that I would I would convince the Prime Minister somehow to come to Turks Island or so you know Turks Island is where my, my heritage is, uh, so that we could sign sign that agreement or at least have him come here. I don't know, Mr. Prime Minister, maybe we can take a defense force, cut it on up off the coast and do a signing on board with you with you on the deck as commander in chief. Um, those are some of the visions that we have. Similarly, and for the same reason, plans to initiate discussions with, with the Republic of Haiti uh, are ongoing. The, the committee, however, through the Maritime Division is actively seeking to re-engage all of those that we have not yet um, completed. Mr. Speaker, the Office of the Spouse, um, which is located in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, is fully operational and continues to function in a professional, efficient manner and in compliance with the guidelines for the operation of the office as approved by the Cabinet of the Bahamas. The office continues to partner with the Bahamas Feeding Network and Women and Girls Mentoring Coalition to provide food and essential items to the numerous families on a weekly basis. In addition, the office continues to create facilitations for women to empower themselves and, and, and the result hosted a series of, of training workshops over the past year to enhance skill sets and promote entrepreneurship among Bahamian women. Mrs. Minnis continues to, to be an advocate against gender-based violence and to raise awareness for mental health care. These issues have become a major concern in recent times due to the apparent increase in cases in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic. During the past year, the Office of the Spouse of the Prime Minister has received international recognition through Mrs. Minister's engagement with diverse organizations, including the International Association of First Ladies for Peace and the Global Youth Meet, GEM organization it's called. As the current chair of the, the Spouses of CARICOM Leaders Action Networks Clan, Mrs. Minister continues to promote the Kariwak Initiative in the region which is the Caribbean's response to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, SDG. Plans are underway to commence a collaborative awareness campaign for cervical cancer across the region due to the apparent increasing incidence of cervical cancer in Caribbean women. Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud of the passport office, extremely proud of them. And so now I turn my attention to, to the passport office and, and the consular division. Despite the challenges with the closure and rotation of staff, the passport office, its sub offices in the Bahamas' consular offices maintained operations and issued passports throughout 2020, 2021, fiscal period. In December 2020, our online portal was expanded to allow the renewal of passports for applicants ages 15 through 17 years. In addition, the digital portal was incorporated into the government's interoperability platform, mygateway.gov.bahamas, which permits the application and collection of passports and other government-issued documents from a central location. Mr. Speaker, subsequent to this accomplishment, the Passport Office extended the services via the opening of satellite offices on several islands commencing with Exuma in February, Enagua and Long Island in March, and Eleuthera in April. In the coming weeks, two additional passport offices will be opened, one in Bimini, and one in North Andros. 
I'm still contemplating whether or not North Andes may need to because of the, the geographical makeup of that island uh, to cause people to travel from south to central all the way north um, might not be uh, conducive to, 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 to reach the objective that we're trying to reach. And so we're very pleased, Mr. Speaker, that we, we are now able to, to cause Bahamians who live in these family islands, as mandated by the Prime Minister, to remain at home apply for and receive their passports without having to even leave that island. During that day. When, we, when we speak to them, when we speak to them about this, um, the reports are that they're very grateful uh, for this caring administration that has, that has availed it, made it possible for them. You know, can you imagine a family of five having to travel to New Providence? Um, to pay, to pay for airfare, to pay for hotel rooms, to pay for cars, to pay for food, and then to go to the passport office and, 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 and yeah, and, and back in those days, back in those days, it used to be like sometimes you go two and three times to the passport office. So your stay, your stay in New Providence may have been extended due to some unforeseen circumstance, which did not avail to you collecting your passport uh, at the time. It, the program is safe because it, it, it is, is a biometric secured, and you can't get your passport unless you, you, you're fingerprinted. And so we're very pleased um, that the Prime Minister encouraged uh, this initiative, and that we will, before the end of the day, I believe we're gonna have passport officers in, in each one of our family islands that need it. Um, and, and for those that don't have it, we will continue to provide the mobile services where, where the mobile passport office will go into that, that, that area or that island and, and conduct the applications. Uh, Mr. Speaker, for the period under review, the passport office has enrolled 43,366 applicants. Of this number, adult enrollments total 27,285. Uh, Minor children enrollments total 7,982. Um, the, the revenue collected by the passport office, its sub offices and the Bahamas, the Bahamas consulates for the period of the 1st of July, 2020 to May, 2021 was $1,183,045.00. Mr. Speaker, for the period under review, the consular division assisted the Department of Immigration with the repatriation of some 1,053 foreign individuals uh, the division continues to facilitate Bahamians in distress in foreign countries and in collaboration with our overseas missions. During this fiscal year, the Council of Division, together with our overseas missions, assisted 539 Bahamians who were distressed and or displaced, mostly, most of whom were, were done so because of the, the lockdowns, the countries that they found themselves in um, indicated or or lockdowns by airplanes that refuse to fly, refuse to, to come to this part of the wor world, or through measures taken by us in the Bahamas. Um, for this budget year, the Council of Division apostille or legalized 4,967 documents, which generated a revenue of $837,540. And for this same period, the division issued 1,030 seven visas for a revenue of $173,240 and zero cents. Mr. Speaker, during the budget year 2020-2021, plans were adjusted in accordance with how the current fiscal budget was comparing to actuals. In the midst of the economic fallout stemming from the COVID-19 pandemic, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs generated a revenue of $2,193,820 in for the fiscal year 2020-2021. Mr. Speaker, as I close, I, I want to take a moment to reflect on, on the manifesto promises that, that the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, undertook when we assumed, when we assumed office. Uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs during the last nearly four years, um, instructed by the manifesto of the Free National Movement in 2017, 
looked at the following areas, establishing of, of, of extending our reach. And we did so by establishing an embassy in Brussels in an effort to mitigate the damaging effects of the neg negative financial listings by the European Union. We're the first government to do that. Um, we actually thought that it would be proved much more effective rather than just remaining over here in the Caribbean or, or in the Bahamas and to put an office at great expense, but we thought it necessary to do so um, in Brussels so that we could more deliberately speak with those individuals who, who consider the listing. Um, we think the office is effective. We, we note, as we, as we indicated just then, the notable um, efforts that we've made in, in issuing of passports and documents this was also a manifesto promise uh, that, that we had. I, I need not relitigate that. Our passport services, though, are, are online, manifesting a marked improvement. I remember, you know, early days, we, we were assailed. We used to be assailed by the press for the long line outside the passport office where people were told that some people said, you know, you had to go at 4 a.m. in the morning and just sit there on the bench. Uh, and, and sometimes you'd, you'd be there all day and still did not make it to the window. Well, that's the thing in the past under this minutes-led administration. You, 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 you can, in the comfort of your own home right now, go on your computer in a secure fashion and renew your passport. And that, that, that I believe, is to be commended. Um, we re-established passport office services for Bahamians and, 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 and China and people in that part of the world in the East, so that they who could be able to go and, and, and conduct their businesses to get passports. Our visas, the Hayman visas are online. Services to international travelers coming to the Bahamas. Um, of course, we opened the kiosk. And, and I want to, I don't want to single out any, any specific offices in this fashion. But, but Fariba Hebburn, who, who leads our missions into the family islands, ahead of establishment of these kiosk or passport offices, in and we're doing it very cost-effectively. I, I think she she is to be commended um, for what she's been able to do. And, and she's from Lausanne? Yeah. For what, for what she's been able to do in helping us to, to establish these offices. Are we coming to you soon, Calder? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're coming to you soon. Participation in the regional hemisphere. You know, under the FNM administration, we have deliberately participated with all regional and hemispheric international organizations, both at the prime ministerial level and the ministerial level. So the prime minister has successfully participated in and contributed to numerous meetings of CARICOM, the Commonwealth Heads of Government, the United Nations, the ACP Committee of Ambassadors. I remember when we went to Brussels, the prime minister was afforded the opportunity to, to present before the African Congress of Ambassadors, which, which I thought was, was a high honor. Um, Bahamas hosted and chaired the Council for Foreign and Community Relations, COFCOR, which is Caribbean, CARICOM's body for foreign ministers uh, in Nassau in May 2018. And, and we served as president, as you heard, of the 50th General uh, Assembly of the OAS. You know, Mr. Speaker, in, in the aftermath of, of Hurricane Dorian, um, the Bahamas received visits by Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the OAS, Louis Amago, and the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Patricia Scotland. These were notable visits, uh, and we, we truly appreciate their solidarity and support. We believe, Mr. Mr. Speaker, that we have done well to improve the, the relations of the Bahamas with, with our neighbors, which was our mandate. You know, the most honorable prime minister um, is currently serving as, as chair, I believe, still of the Joint Tourism Policy working group of CARICOM. Um, His Excellency Ruben Raming is currently chair of the Human and Social Development COSART. Uh, and so, so we're, we're fully involved and engaged. And we have membership in the International Maritime Organization. We have membership on the Convention for the Elimination of, of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW. And we, are, we also have membership serving as second chair in the Human Rights Council. So I think we're, we're delivering well above our weight, and we're doing well. It is our view uh, that many demonstrable uh, activities firming up our relations with our neighbors are manifested through the many strategic steps taken by this government to, to improve regional relations. 
um, in this last um, time, in this last administration, the United States of America nominated not one but two ambassadors to the Bahamas, albeit both unsuccessfully. That said, nothing uh, was more evident of the importance of our ties than the United States' response during and after the passage of Hurricane Dorian. The Prime Minister attended a high-level meeting in Florida at the invitation of, of the sitting President, uh, President Trump. Uh, the Bahamas and the United States re-engaged talk toward delimiting our boundaries. You know, this, this goes unnoted a lot, but the United Kingdom re-established its High Commission in the Bahamas on our watch in February 2020, following a near 15-year absence. For 15 years, I'm not attributing blame to anyone, but I'm just saying that that, that, that was a notable uh, achievement, I think. Uh, so deepening at the time, at the time when we had the Commonwealth, the, the now Prime Minister promised me that he would come, um, Prime Minister Johnson, but he could not make it for, for, for obvious reasons. Uh, through deepening relations with Cuba, um, both at the prime ministerial level and the ministerial level, we managed to convince the Cuban government to assist with the apprehension and handover of three, not one, but three poaching vessels, motherships, uh, seeking to evade arrest by fleeing into Cuban territorial waters. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's, that's important. That's important because you remember what precipitated the sinking of, of HMBS Flamingo in 1980, and then, and then you see the progression of our relationship to this point, um, where, where we now cooperate very deeply with our forces, the Defense Force and the Cuban Border Guard, uh, a very strong, strong relationship. Uh, of course, I spoke to our engagement with, with, with the diaspora. Mr. Speaker, with that, I know I've kept you a while, with that, North Abaco supports the 2020-22 budget. And may Almighty God continue to bless and keep the Commonwealth of the Bahamas and all our endeavors. I thank you, sir. Thank, thank you very much, Honorable Member. As many, you recognize this Honorable Member for Central and South Abaco. You recognize this Honorable Member for Southern Shores. Mr. Speaker, I move that the business of this house suspends for the luncheon break until 3 p.m. Is there a second now? Yes. Honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that the business of this house suspends until 3 p.m. this afternoon. As many members that are in favor remain seated, those who oppose will stand. The business of this house stands suspended until 3 p.m. this afternoon. All right.